And everybody said, yes. Wonderful. God bless you. Amen. And the Lord enrich every life tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for this. I thank you for your goodness. And thank you because of your power. Thank you because you've called us. And we're praying, oh Lord, your call will be effective in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Every weakness will drive away. Amen. Ignorance will drive away. Amen. Lethargy will drive away. Amen. Lukewarmness and coldness will drive away. Amen. We'll rise up to the challenge of the day in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your people. Use your people to be a blessing to the old church. And use your church to reach the world around us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see now we're coming to Exodus chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by the reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. As I read that verse to you, you wonder what that has to do with leadership. You see, when God chooses a leader, when God raises up a pastor, when God chooses a worker, it's for a purpose. And the purpose is because all these people in our communities, they are suffering. And because of that suffering, he's raising up a leader so that that leader will go out and reach those people and solve their problems. You'll be a problem solver. I said you'll be a problem solver. Because of that, God told Moses and said, I've seen the affliction. I've seen their sorrow. I've seen their suffering. Look at verse 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the, the Egyptians oppressed them. Look at verse 10. Come now, therefore. You see that word therefore there? It says, come now, therefore. They're crying. They're suffering. They're oppressed. And a lot of calamity is happening unto them. Because of that, that's why I'm choosing you. Come now, therefore. And then it says, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Tonight we're looking at this message, empowering leadership for spiritual progress. Empowering leadership. For spiritual progress, you will make progress. Spiritual progress, we're going to make in Jesus' name. Empowering leadership for spiritual progress. Look at that, those verses I read to you. The Lord said, I've seen their affliction. Because of that, that's why I'm calling you. The implication of that is, if after Moses came, the affliction remained there, the purpose of the call is not fulfilled. And then he said, I have seen, I have had their cry, the cry of their taskmasters. If after the leader has come, the cry remains the same, we have fulfilled no purpose. And then he says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. If the Egyptians are so stronger, if they're still oppressive and if they're still holding them in bondage, then leadership is worthless. Leadership has meant nothing. And then he says, I'm taking them unto a good land and a large land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. That means if the people still remain in the same old poverty, in the same old penury, and in the same old suffering and oppression, then leadership means nothing. And then he goes on to say, I will take them unto the land of Canaan, of the heat of the Amorites and of the Perizzites and of the Hivites and of the Jebusites. If they didn't get to the land, 
That means leadership became worthless. And then he says, now therefore, behold, the crime of the children of Israel is come unto me. If after God has chosen Moses, if after God has chosen you and has chosen me, our cries remain the same. Our oppression remains the same. Sicknesses remain the same. Our defeat remains the same. Then there's no point that we have been chosen as leaders. It says, I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. The same oppressors we feared before. The same oppressors that all these people feared before. They still feared the same oppressors. Then our leadership means nothing. I want you to begin to examine now in your mind uh, the attitude of members in your local church. The attitude of the fears, of the affliction, of the tradition, of the superstition of the people inside your local church. If they still feared witches and wizards like when they were unbelievers, our leadership means nothing. And if they still fear the Egyptians like they used to fear the Egyptians, our leadership means nothing. If they still talk the way they were talking before, are talking fear, are talking oppression, are talking superstition, and then when they have a little dreamer, then they are sweating. If it is still the same, we're not leading the people because that's exactly the reason why we are called. And now the same thing is still happening to them. Look at verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee thee unto Pharaoh. I will send thee to Pharaoh. If the people fear the superman, and we fear that same superman, we're not leaders. If the people are kind of, they're timid and they're shivering, honor that superman, whatever the superman is, Pharaoh or anybody, if they're still afraid, and we are afraid, we who are being sent to the superman, then it means that leadership means nothing. It says, come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my my people, the children of Israel, tell me the next word there. Out, tell me again. Tell me very well. Out of Egypt. Now look at this. When Moses got to Egypt, there were many miracles, you know. Water turned to blood. The rod turned to a snake. The snake turned back again, and then lies came upon the people. Locusts devastated the land, and then there was darkness. All those miracles, listen to this now, all those miracles would be worthless if they didn't come out of Egypt. All those miracles, the miracles are for a purpose, and the miracles are for an end. And if all those miracles take place, and yet the people remained in Egypt, Moses' leadership was worthless. The same thing we need to talk to ourselves, all the things that we're doing, all the labors we have, all the efforts we make, all the miracles we see, all the crusades we have held, and all the congresses we have held, all the training we're holding, all the development we're be meaningless if our members remain the same, if our families remain the same, if our workers have not come out, out of Egypt, out of darkness, out of occultism, out of the things that oppress them. Because you see, the final thing is the coming out. If the people have not come out of the world, miracles mean nothing. And if the people have not come out of the occultism, out of those secret calls, they're coming to church and they're coming to retreat and attending this, attending that, and we laboring and sweating, everything means nothing. Not only that, you look at the children of Israel, look at Moses, the concern of the Lord is, number one, bring them out. That's not the end. I'm going to take them onto a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, if they came out and they passed through the wilderness, if they didn't get to the land of Canaan, the land of promise, all the signs and the wonders and the wilderness would have been worthless for Israel. All those, uh, the water coming out of the rock, all the things we we'll see, like Red Sea being parted in two, all those things about the manna that came for them, great signs and wonders, they'll mean nothing if they didn't get into the promised land. You think about what we are doing, uh, you know, we do quite a lot in deeper life in our leadership. We're active, we're preaching, we're teaching, we're interceding, we're counseling, we're witnessing. We're 
sacrificing we're watching over the people we're doing a lot of things during the week and even on sunday and yet you understand if they do not get to the promised land all our activities will be worse than nothing will be worse than useless that means then we need to understand the reason why we're leaders it's not just that you know we got a miracle Thank God we got a miracle. We got revival. Thank God we got revival. And we're receiving teaching. Thank God we're receiving teaching. What is the end result? And what is the real purpose? The purpose we're talking about had been a purpose decided by the Lord much, much before Moses was born. I want you to look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 and see now before Moses ever came to this world see what the Lord had said Genesis chapter 15 verse 13 it says and he said unto Abram even before Abram was changed to Abram and he said unto Abram know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs that's in egypt and shall serve them shall serve the egyptians and they shall afflict them four hundred years and also that nation whom they shall serve will i judge afterward they shall tell me afterward shall they tell me come out with great substance this is referring to the ministry of Moses. Before Moses was born, God had decided that long, long before. He said afterward, they will come out with great substance and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace and thou shalt be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation shall they come hither again. In the fourth generation shall they come hither again. I want you to look at Exodus now. Exodus chapter 12. We're reading from verse 40. It says now, look at this. The sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt is, tell me, 430 years. And it came to pass that at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, look at that, even the same self day, it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went, how? Out from the land of Egypt. You see, it was fulfilled at this time. So, it is not just a miracle. It's the purpose of the miracle. It's not just the message. It's the purpose of the message. It's not just the leadership. It's the purpose of the leadership. That's why we understand that all the miracles, all the signs and the wonders, all the activities and all the labor, all the night vigil, all that we're doing, without the people coming out, out of Egypt and going in, into the land, of Canaan, the promised land, everything we're doing will be useless. You will not do a useless work. Your work will be purposeful. And your work will be rewardable in Jesus' name. Empowering leadership. That's why we're empowering leadership. And that's what we're empowering us for. We're empowering leadership for spiritual progress. For spiritual breakthrough. So that the people of God we're ministering to, they will come out. I said they will come out. And not only they will come out, they will go into the promised land in Jesus' name. Three things we're going to look at. Number one, the compelling commission. The compelling commission of purpose-fulfilling leadership. The compelling commission of purpose-fulfilling leadership. That is, a leadership must fulfill the purpose. And that's the compelling commission. The commission is there, and I'm compelled, and you are compelled, that we're looking at the purpose every time, and the purpose is being fulfilled. Point number two, the contagious contamination of previously faithful leadership previously faithful leadership the contagious contamination of previously faithful leadership those of us who have been serving the lord for many many years faithful previously faithful previously faithful and then little by little there can be a contamination Little by little, there can be some compromise. Little by little, there be some corruption coming into that kind of leadership. And it is contagious. It affects the man 
then later the woman, then later the youth, then later the children, then later the campus, then later any other section, every other section, and starts in a very small way the contagious contamination of previously faithful leadership. Point number three, the consistent concentration. Consistent concentration. That is focus. That is you are direct. That is you say this is it. You will not shift to the right. You will not shift to the left. You will not allow anything to distract your attention. There will be no other interest. There is no other desire. This one thing must be done. And you are concentrating on that consistently. The consistent concentration of positively fruitful leadership. Positively fruitful leadership. What's number one there? One, two, three, go. Number one. The compelling commission of purpose fulfilling leadership. Now, we need to understand, we're going to use the leadership call of Moses to look at the purpose and to look at how we fulfill this purpose. We're coming back to Exodus chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 10. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. The companion commission here, as Moses will be going to Egypt, is that all the no church of Israel and nobody in Israel will remain in Egypt. Everyone, every man, everyone, every woman, everyone, every single person, every bachelor, every spinster, everyone, every boy, every girl of Israel coming out, coming out, coming out. They're coming out in Jesus' name. As you take the work of the Lord in that community, the people that Jesus Christ died for, they're in Egypt, they're in the world, they're in darkness, they're in sin, and there's one compelling purpose you have, one compelling commission you have, you are bringing them out of sin. Give me a good amen. amen. Out of darkness. Give me a good amen. amen. Out of secret society, you are bringing them out in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at uh, chapter 19 of Exodus. Exodus chapter 19 uh, and I'm reading from verse 4. Exodus chapter 19 uh, verse 4. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. They come to church as you look at your congregation. Has that one come out of the world? Has it come out of Egypt? Has that one come out of sin? Has that one come out of darkness? Because if not, your labor is worthless. If not, the purpose why God called you is uh, worthless and totally useless. Bringing them out, bringing them out, they will come out. Look at it, Exodus chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Look at that, look at that. And brought you unto myself. These people are coming to church, they come to Deeper Life Bible Church, and they've been brought unto himself. That's the purpose, not the compelling commission. Have they been brought out of sin to the Savior? Out of darkness to the light. Out of idolatry to the only true God. Have they come out of their evil, whatever it is, and they have come to God, their creator, their maker, their redeemer. Because that's the compelling purpose of leadership. That we are bringing them unto himself. Look at verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people uh, for all the earth. Earth is mine. Look at that. Above all people, can we say the congregation that I'm teaching, the members that I'm influencing, that they are above their neighbors? In honesty, are they above? In a faithfulness, are they above? In the understanding of the word of God, are they above? Or are they just coming to the church and they're just like all the other people? The purpose and the calling that God gave Moses, that God has given us, is that they will be peculiar people above all the other people on earth. That is their understanding, their faith their confidence in God, their courage in the Lord, and the ability to pray, and the ability to seek the face of the Lord, hold on to the promise of God, the people that are associated with us, 
if we're fulfilling the call of God upon our lives, they are above all the people on, to, on the earth. Look at this in verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Uh, the people we are, we say that we are ministering to, are we fulfilling this purpose? Do they know what it means to be the priesthood of the believer? Can they pray to God? Can they read the Bible? Do they understand God? And do they know about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Do they understand? There's no other name by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus. We're looking at chapter 20, chapter 20 of Exodus, verse 1. It says, And the Lord spake all of this word, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee, tell me, out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You see, the Lord is always mentioning that. So as to remind Moses and remind leadership that they must come out. If the people have not come out, what are we rejoicing about? What work are we doing? What miracles are we performing? And what benefits are we giving them? What numbers are we counting? We have that number in our local church. We have that number in the group. We have that number in the region. We have that number in the state. We have that number in the whole nation. What numbers are we counting? If the people have not come out, they must come out, out of tradition out of darkness, out of evil, because that is the real purpose of the calling. That's the real purpose of the commission. And I look at verse 3. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The people we are you know, ministering to, do they know that this is the only true God? This is the only living God. And this God will be my God, and this Jesus will be my Savior. And it says in verse 4, Thou shalt not make uh, any graven image or any likeness of any sinner that is in the heaven above, all that is in the earth beneath, all that is in the waters under the earth. And thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them. Have they done this? Because you see, if uh, Moses, uh, you remember when Moses went to the mountain uh, to receive the law from the Lord and the children of Israel had gone back into making a calf and they contradicted exactly this one. God said, ministry is over. All the miracles over. Everything over. They are not my inheritance and I will destroy them and make out of you a nation greater than them. Because, you know, it is their coming out of that idolatry. It is their coming out of all that darkness that is the ministry. The ministry is not just, you know, he gave us manna, he gave us water out of the rock, he gave us this, he gave us that. There must be obedience to that word of God. Now, the people who are leading, I will let them into obedience. And we let them into staying and remaining with this only one true God. Or whenever there is any challenge, they know the, you know, herbalist to go to. And they know the occultic uh, person to go to. Look at this in verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The people were leading. Do they have honor for God? Do they have respect for God? Do they hold the name of the almighty God, the most high? Do they hold him sacred? Or any little thing, uh, you know, they'll say Jesus. You know, the, the car gets into a gallop Jesus. And uh, something uh, happened to them that gave them surprise, Jesus. And they just call Jesus anyhow. They cannot even call the name of the earthly father anyhow like that. They will not call the name of, uh, you know, their local authority uh, in just like that. And they just flip oh God, oh Jesus, oh whatever, and all that. And they use the name of God as if they are swelling with that name. You see, what the Lord is saying is that this is your ministry. If you don't drill this to them, if their conversion, their conviction, their consecration, if their life does not reflect this, Moses, there's no ministry. The ministry is not just, uh, you know, opening the Red Sea. The ministry is not just hanging a serpent on the pole for them to look at. The ministry is not just striking the rock and bringing water out. This is the ministry. Because this is what shows that they'll be totally different, completely distinct, and differentiated from all the people of the world and from all the Egyptians that they left behind and from the Canaanites that they were going to. Totally different because 
because the grace of God has come into their lives, has transformed them, turned everything around. And I pray that that same conviction will come to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, verse eight remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The people were ministry to, what do they do on Sunday, on the Lord's day? Do they count Sunday like Saturday, Sunday like Friday, Sunday like Wednesday, and Sunday like Monday, and there's no difference at all? They cannot give, they cannot consecrate or commit that whole day unto the Lord. What God was telling him, Moses is, these people you are leading, if your ministry is going to have impact on them, have any influence or, 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 or kind of effect on them, they must have this day that they say, this is totally for the Lord. How many of the people come early to church on Sunday? How many of the people stay through on Sunday? How many of the people uh, will go back to their market on Sunday? Because to them, it doesn't mean anything. And God was telling Moses, you see, you bring them out. And then you also bring Egypt out of them. Bring them out of Egypt and then bring Egypt out of them. Bring the tradition of Egypt out of them. Bring the worship of Egypt out of them. And bring the idolatry of Egypt out of them. Bring everything of Egypt out of them. The, uh, it's a two-way process. Number one, bring them out of Egypt. Number two, bring Egypt out of them. We're looking at that same chapter 20, verse 22. Look at verse 22. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Moses tell them, Ye have seen that I have talked to you from heaven. The people were leading. Do they know that the word is coming to them from heaven? Or do they think, well, that's Jesus talking from earth? That's pastor talking from earth. That's an overseer talking from earth. Do they have the consciousness that we're hearing from heaven? How are they responding to that word they're hearing from heaven? Look at verse 24. In verse 24 it says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, and thy sheep, and thy oxen, in all the places where I record my name. I will come unto thee and tell me and I will bless thee. You see, you tell them that the meetings you have, they're not just like ordinary. When you have those meetings, it's a place I have appointed, and I will come there myself, and I will bless you. Our people that we are leading, do they have understanding, consciousness of the presence of God, of the presence of Christ, of the presence of the Holy Spirit? That's, that's, the, that's the ministry God has given us. You see, just bringing them out is not enough. We must bring them through. And they must bring them to the presence of God. I'm reading now from Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. We've looked at Exodus. We're looking at Leviticus now chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 8. Leviticus chapter 10. And we're looking at it from verse 8. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou, nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into... Eat of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest she die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. It shall be a statute, how long? It shall be a statute, tell me how long? Forever. In all your generations, are the people who are leading, do they, are they saying, ah, salvation from sin, living above sin, ah? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but now it's a new generation. The doctrine they are hearing, they don't understand, shall be your generations forever and ever. If we don't drill that into them, if they don't understand that, we don't have ministry, we don't have ministry, we're just teaching them some superficial things that doesn't have any conviction, deep conviction in their heart. Look at verse 10, and ye shall put the difference between the holy and unholy, and between between the cleaner and the unclean, the people should understand there is a difference. We're looking at uh, chapter 18 from verse 1. Chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 18 from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. The doings of the land of Egypt, 
the doings of the land of Egypt when ye dwelt, past tense, shall ye not do. Stop there for a moment. You see, that's the, that's the ministry. Moses was to make them understand what has happened to you. That's what we call salvation. He saved you out of Egypt. What has happened to you? That's what we call redemption. He redeemed you out of Egypt. And what has happened to you? That's what you call deliverance. It, it delivered you out of Egypt. Now forget Egypt completely. The marriage of Egypt forget completely. Ceremonies of Egypt forget completely. Association with Egypt forget completely. That's the ministry of Moses. That's the calling of Moses. Because it says over here, speak unto the children of Israel. Tell them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, they wherein ye dwelt shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, ye shall not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. You see, if the people were leading, they, they don't understand. They don't understand. What is the conversion? And what is the life that is totally different? You know, sometimes if the pastor will not see this, if our overseer will not see this, if so and so will not see this, they go to the village and they do like the Egyptians and they go to their communities and they do like the traditions of the people even the people that say they are workers even the people that say they are leaders it means there's no ministry on them there's no effect on them they may get healed they may get water out of the rock they may get manna coming from heaven they may get whatever but the same tradition of the world the same principles of the world sealing them and the lord is saying moses you know if you're really going to carry out ministry you are going to have influence and impact and effect upon those people they are not going to continue to do like the people of egypt let's come to numbers now numbers chapter 11 Numbers chapter 11. And now you can tell we're coming from Exodus and we're going to uh, through the, um, Leviticus and now Numbers. We're getting far away from Exodus at the beginning. But look at what happened here. In Numbers chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 4. Numbers chapter 11, reading from verse, tell me, from verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell and lost him. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Can you think about this? We're coming all the way from Exodus chapter 12. And now we're in Numbers chapter 11. A far journey they have taken. And uh, now Moses, can we evaluate the ministry? Moses, can we examine the ministry? Moses, can we test the ministry? How do we test the ministry? Look at your people. And have they forgotten Egypt? They came out of Egypt. As Egypt come out of them, look at verse 5. Look at this. We remember the fear which we did eat where in Egypt freely the cucumbers and the melons and the leaves and the onions and the garlic and now they went on like that Egypt had not come out of them Egypt had not come out of them the traditions of your people have they come out of you the ideas of your people have they come out of you the ideologies of your people have they come out of you look at the journey we've come out of egypt since so many years now all we can remember is egypt all we can remember is egypt and he's saying moses you know you've got a lot of work to do the people have come out of egypt you must not bring egypt out of them and all these people that lost head after those things see what happened look at verse 10 and moses heard that the people that had the people weep throughout their families, every man, every man, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. The anger of the Lord was kindled greatly because Egypt had not come out of them. That means then, as we look at our ministries, as we look at our leadership, and we have not brought all these things away from the minds and the hearts of the people, uh, the Lord is saying, I'm not happy with them. I'm angry agree with them. Numbers chapter 15 verse 39. Numbers 15 verse 39. It says and it shall be unto you a fringe that she may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord. 
Remember, all the commandments of the Lord. When temptation comes, that's what you remember. When trials comes, that's what you remember. And when difficulties come, that's what you remember. Remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and do them that she seek not after your own heart, that she seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which she used to go a warring, that she may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord, your God, which brought you, tell me, out of the land of Egypt. You know, the Lord is always reminding them, I brought you out of the land of Egypt so that I can bring Egypt out of you. I don't want any tradition of Egypt to remain in you, any practice of Egypt to remain in you. I want you to be totally separated, separated from Egypt, and Egypt is separated, taken out of you. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy now, Deuteronomy chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 10, we're reading from verse 16. You see what the Lord was telling him. Moses, it's not just, you know, they came out, they came out, they came out. Yes, they came out, something yet must follow. We're looking at chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 16. Circumcise, therefore, the first king of your heart, and be no more stiff nature. Circumcise therefore the first king of your heart and be no more stiff neck. Moses, you know, as long as there's stiff neck in the children of Israel, your ministry is still no, not, not what it should be. All the stiff neck must be taken out because that's the character of Egypt. That's the attitude of Egypt. That's the disposition of Egypt. Verse 17, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of laws, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regarded not persons, nor taketh reward. We're looking at chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm reading from verse 6. This is chapter 30, looking at verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Moses, bring them to me. I need to circumcise their heart. It is not enough they have been circumcised physically. The Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. And then it says, and the heart of thy seed. And then it goes on to say, so that they can love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And so we see the compelling ministry. The commission for leadership was clear and it was compelling. There was no allowance for excuse, for alteration, for personal reservation, and for weakness, or for consultation with other nations. Moses was not allowed to go and consult with the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Hittites. And then after that consultation, say, okay, circumcision of heart, that's not popular. And then say, all the commandments of the law that we need to obey, that's not a general thing, it's not popular. All the others are not doing like that. We want to be like them. No, you cannot be like them. You must come above them. That's the calling the Lord had given to Moses. And that's the compelling commission the Lord has given to us. And I pray that God will make us to understand in depth the commission and the calling he has given unto us in Jesus' name. And then we will follow through. We will not be satisfied with somebody got healed and somebody got a lame a person there got well and all those things are good but the purpose of ministry the end of it the target of ministry and the destination of ministry is to bring them tell me out of Egypt and to bring Egypt out of them it will happen in Jesus name now why is it that as we look at the children of Israel themselves, as we look at them years, years later, that things came down and it wasn't like it was originally. Because if you know what happened to them, then you know what is happening to us. And you will know how we need to tighten our belts again, how we need to rise up again and then face the ministry squarely and say, this is what the Lord has called me to and it will be done. It will be done in Jesus' name. That brings us to point number two. What is point number two there? 
the contagious contamination of previously faithful leadership. Previously faithful leadership. Uh, have you noticed that, you know, as you are getting older and as you are getting more experience in the church, it's like the fervency that was there before is no more there. It's like uh, the, uh, the conviction that was there before is no more there. It's like the earnestness, earnestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. It's like the earnestness is no more there. It's like the running, running fast, running the race that is set before you. That running is no more there. It's like the eagerness, eagerness to see souls saved, eagerness to touch lives, eagerness to transform people. It's like that is no more there. And look at Isaiah now, Isaiah chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 9, we're looking at verse 16. Isaiah chapter 9, what verse? Verse 16, for the leaders of these people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. The leaders of these people cause them to err. The leaders of these people, they cause them to go astray. And the people who are led, the people who are following, they themselves are destroyed. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 15. Jeremiah 18, verse 15, because my people, look at that, my people have forgotten me. They have burnt incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast off. That is the leaders, the ancients. The elders, they have led the people astray. And the, the seriousness with which you took the word of God, with which you took a repentance or restitution or conversion or water baptism or the life we ought to live, the seriousness is no more there. Yes, we believe it in the head. We believe it is in the Bible. And uh, when we have a chance, we still teach the people the eagerness to urge them, the eagerness to tell them, have you done this? Have you really done your restitution? Have you been baptized in water? And now if you say you are saved, have you been sanctified? Are you made holy? Do you have purity of heart? Are you thinking about heaven? All that eagerness is no more there. Because the ancients and the leaders, they are slow. And therefore the people themselves, they are slow. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 3. Israel, tell me was holiness unto the Lord. Was, no more, no more, was holiness unto the Lord. That is, in the past, holiness was a watchword. In the past, holiness was the center. In the past, holiness was the conversation. In the past, holiness was considered even in our dressing. In the past, holiness was considered in marriage ceremony. In the past, holiness was considered in our conversation. Holiness was considered in everything. But now, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. Uh, but what made that to change? Why is it that Israel was no more like that? I'm looking at Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Malachi chapter 2, reading from verse 5. My covenant was, you see that past tense, my covenant was with him of life and peace. I, and I gave them to him for the fear, wherewith he feared me. I was afraid before my name. You see, uh, when we're conscious of who God is, anything I say, God is a silent listener. Everywhere I go, God is a silent observer. I'm not conscious about that all the time. Are you as conscious of that today? That every conversation he hears, every action he weighs, all the actions, and every place you go, he looks at everything. The motive of the heart, the intention of the heart, and the direction direction of your life that God is watching that today or your God is now blind you cannot see your God is now deaf he cannot hear your God is dead because you're not conscious of a lively God a living God that looks at every action anymore God is no more in, in connection with you and you're no more in connection with God it's like whatever I do God is not concerned because uh, you know I don't have that a uh, closeness or nearness to God I can do whatever well that's what you think uh, because you are no more like you used to be look at verse 6 
things. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. Past tense, he walked with me in peace and equity. And they did turn, did turn, did turn many away from iniquity. In the past, just you coming, your presence alone will make people to check themselves. Ah, I cannot do that. Pastor is coming. My leader is coming. Even when you are just a real leader, even when you are just a house fellowship leader, the respect and the honor because of the holiness and the righteousness, because of the fear of God, and because of the anointing that you carried as a house fellowship leader, as an area leader, not to talk of a zona leader or a women rep at that time, because of that honor, the people feared God and the people honored you. Look at verse 6. It says, For the priest leaves should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts now as we look at uh, the contagious contamination what is happening the contagious contamination I'm going to use the letters of the word leadership L lesser G E entanglement A absconding D, deceptive. E, evasive. R, ruinous. S, speechless. H, hypocritical. I, ignorant. P, partial. You see, the things that have come in. L, lethargic leadership. Lethargic leadership. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 17. Acts chapter 18 verse 17. Then all the Greek Jews, sustainers, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Galileo cared for none of those things. This was the leader Galileo. Political though community leader. And then they took this man and they beat him up mercilessly in his presence. He was just looking at them, lethargic. It didn't concern him. And that's what leaders are today. A lot of things happening. And we see a boy and a girl doing something. We're so used to it. It just, you know, it doesn't matter to us. And we see somebody, a married woman, with another person, not her husband, members of the church, and they are carrying on some illicit uh, uh, relationship. And, you know, we know it. And, you know, we're just lethargic. Lethargic leadership. And we see people that do things and say things. And things that this cannot be right. This is not holiness. This is not right. Righteousness. This is not a conviction of the word of God, but we're just lethargic and it doesn't matter to us. He entangled leadership, entangled leadership. When leaders are entangled with the members of the church in money, entangled in business, entangled in fraud, entangled in cheating, entangled in tradition. When the entanglement is there, what do you expect of the church? It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Entangled leadership. A absconding leadership. Absconding leadership. You know, on Sunday, the leader, he's not there. Monday Bible study is coming to us with transmission. The, Bible, the leader is not there. The pastor, the shepherd is not there. And the workers uh, training, the leader is not there. And the, the uh, Tuesday the, uh, development, the leader is not there. And they're getting some other things done. Maybe it's extramural studies. Maybe it is this or that. And when leaders abscond, absconding leaders, that's what it's going to produce, it's going to bring contagion just contamination because the members too they know that's how the leader is acting they are going to act like that too we're looking at john chapter 10 john chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 12 john 
chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are, sees the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep, and they fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep, and the hireling fleeth because he's an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Sometimes it is like. Um, you know, the uh, leader is traveled for three months, for four months. Where is he gone? He's gone for leading somewhere. He's gone for something somewhere. I've scorned in leadership. And they expect that the congregation should be kept for them. The congregation without father, without pastor, without shepherd, the absconding leader, he feels that when he comes back, he's still going to meet his congregation there. He's telephoning them from wherever he is. How are you doing over there? How are you getting on over there? You can do well without me. Yes, we can do well without you because when you are here what was your impact what was your leadership that's the point there d the deceptive leadership deceptive leadership i'm reading from jeremiah chapter 10 jeremiah chapter 10 and i'm reading from verse 21 jeremiah chapter 10 we're reading from verse 21 are you there i said have you opened your bible okay tell me what you find there thank you for the pastors have become brutish and I've not sought the Lord. Pastors, they don't have prayer lives. Pastors, they don't read the Bible. Pastors, they don't hear from God. The pastors have become brutish and they seek not the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. All their flocks scattered. E, evasive leadership evasive leadership uh, you, you find uh, you know some leaders when questions are asked at the after start the scripture and uh, the, you know the person asking the question very sincere wanting to know how about this and how about this how about that he's evasive he leaves uh, that thing uh, and then he parambulates and goes this way and goes that way and goes that way and eventually uh, well, after parambulating and he has taken time and the fellow who has the question is getting ashamed and say what did even, I even ask the question and then the pastor will say do you understand and then the fellow will say yes sir but we know that really even those of us who are listening we didn't understand and uh, you know if i were there i would have said even i myself yes i don't understand your answer because that does not go along with the question a visive leadership and there are times when people they're going to get married and they it's, can i do this can i do that i don't want them to hear that it's me that said and so we're inside this way and inside this we're not we're not definite we don't have conviction we're not passing conviction along to the people and we just evade the situation a visible leadership we're busy in ministry but it's not a concrete ministry we're busy in answering questions but we don't go direct to the bible we're busy in a this and that but it's benefiting nobody everything is superficial on the surface we're looking at first kings chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 39 first kings chapter 20 verse 39 and as the king passed by he cried unto the king and he he said thy servant went out into the midst of the battle and behold a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said keep this man keep this man this is your job keep this man keep him in the faith keep him in the kingdom keep him for the lord keep this man if by any means he be missing thy life shall be for his life or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver and as the servant was busy here and there not on the real thing not on the real issue as the servant was busy here and there he was gone and the king of israel said unto him so shall thy judgment be thou thyself as decide it and then R is ruinous leadership. Ruinous leadership, a, a kind of leadership that ruins the church, that ruins the flock, that scatters the flock. That instead of building, we're building with one hand and they're destroying with the other hand. Ruinous leadership. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 12. Isaiah chapter 3. Reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Oh, my people. 
people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy path. They which lead thee, the people who are leading, the, the people destroying the flock, and this is ruinous leadership. And when that scatters all around, that district is like that, that group is like that, that region is like that, and that place is like that, what are we going to have? That's why the leadership that was there fervent, the leadership that was there earnest, the leadership that was there having conviction, the leadership that was there going directly and reaching out to the people, getting them out of Egypt and getting them them to the land of Canada, the promised land, that ministry, where is the ministry today? And where is the pastors with fire and power and with purpose and with unction and with earnestness and that are not lukewarm that will say, this is the way, walk ye therein. I pray God will raise you up. Ruinous leadership is speechless leadership. Speechless leadership. The leader has lost his voice, has lost his weight has lost his authority. He's too common with the people. He eats everywhere. He dines everywhere. He borrows money from everyone. And he gets uh, whatever it is from everyone. He begs the people, can you give me this? Can you give me that? Can you lend me this? Can you lend me that? And all the money he has borrowed is not paid anybody. And then he comes to the church. He looks at that one. And when their eyes uh, meet, he says, uh, the other one says, Pastor, you remember, I'm still expecting my money. He means that one. Pastor, remember, I'm expecting my money. He's speechless. He cannot talk. He doesn't have a voice anymore. There's nothing he can say anymore because of his situation. Look at this in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 22. Luke chapter 1, verse 22. Look at this. It says, and when he came out, he could not speak unto them and they perceived that he has seen a vision in the temple and he beckoned unto them and remained tell me speechless remained speechless you know sometimes uh, the daughter reported to the mother uh, the pastor called me called me to come and fill a particular form called me to come and do this and said he was going to teach me uh, something and you know the pastor started touching me and touching different parts of my body and I said pastor 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 and then I escaped and that lady that girl has told the mother and then the mother uh, you know called the pastor and said pastor I hear I know what's going on. My daughter told me, he comes to the church, he's speechless. How can a pastor like that talk? What can he preach? Because that woman is there, okay, pastor, go ahead and keep on preaching. He's speechless. You see, that's the reason why the leadership is ruined. And I pray that God will bring revival of true leadership in the church everywhere in Jesus' name. Age, hypocritical leadership. Hypocritical leadership. I'm looking at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 14. Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 14. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, thou hypocrite, does not each, of, each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox and or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering a hypocritical leadership. You see, when we're hypocritical and the people know, and the people can challenge us, Pastor, you said I should not do that, but um, I don't want to confront my pastor, but I happen to know the other time that you did something similar like that too. Uh, 
pastor, I had you call my wife, and you were telling my wife not to wear that kind of thing, pastor. Why are we doing like that? Why are we practicing double standard? Uh, so, I'm sorry, sir. With all due respect, your wife does something worse than that. And then, the pastor, I, my daughter came home and told me that you were challenging her, that how about this, how about this? Pastor, how can you talk like that? Because we all know your, do your daughter is living with us here, and all your daughters, the three of them, this is the way they are. And you have mouth to open and to talk to my daughter like that. They know we're hypocritical. And if we're hypocritical, we don't have a voice. We don't have a word. We don't have anything to say. It says charity begins at home. Ministry begins at home. You are afraid of your, of your wife. You cannot talk to your wife. And it's my wife you can talk to. That's hypocrisy. You are afraid of your own boy. You, you cannot talk to your boy there. And it's my boy you can talk to. That's hypocrisy now. Let it begin at home. Talk to them at home. And when things are all right at home, then you can come to the pulpit and lamp past me. I accept that because I know you have put your house right you put your house in order everything will be all right whatever you say that's how to kill hypocrisy and this kind of leadership out of the church the Lord will help you the Lord will help me will help all of us together in Jesus name we're looking I is ignorant leadership ignorant leadership I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 56 Isaiah chapter 56 and I'm reading from verse 10 ignorant leadership ignorant leadership that's actually what destroyed the church at that time Isaiah chapter 56 and we're reading from verse 10 it says it's watchmen are blind they are all ignorant they all are dumb dogs and they cannot back sleeping lying down loving to slumber and so you find here it says the watchmen they are blind and ignorant they are supposed to watch over the people but it is ignorant terrible ignorance in the midst of the people I pray that the knowledge of the word will come to every one of us we will wake up we will rise up and we will do proper ministry in Jesus name and then P is partial leadership partial leadership you see there are people that will teach but they are partial the people that will quote the word of God they are partial uh, if I quote that area it will affect pastor so-and-so a pastor so-and-so might think I'm preaching against him but that's the word of God if I quote that word uh, it will affect my wife and my wife may say when we get back home uh -uh, my husband why do you need to talk to me privately I see you went out there and you read that Bible and everybody was looking my direction and they knew that you know you must have been you know thinking about me why are you going to a passion in the word of God? If we're going to do like that, I cut off this verse because of that brother there. I cut off this verse because of that sister there. I cut off this verse because of my child over there. I cut off that verse because of my friend over there. We're going to cut off everything. And we're not going to preach the word of God. When you come on the pulpit, like God called Moses, and he gave Moses the word of God. He gave the word to everybody, no matter who it affects. We're preparing everybody everybody for heaven you're preparing your wife for heaven am i right uh -huh. if the word affects her let her get ready for heaven and your daughter and your son and your friend and your fellow brother and your fellow pastor and your fellow you know colleague you're preparing everybody for heaven and so if the word comes to them directly praise the lord the pastor wants everybody to get to heaven and we're going to get there you will get there i said you will get there it will happen in Jesus' name. Partial leadership. We're looking at uh, Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 8. Malachi chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 8. Malachi chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, but ye are departed out of the way. Talking to leaders. And ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways. And tell me the rest. Tell me out loud. 
and have been partial in the law. Partial in the law. We preach this one deliberately. We keep quiet on that other area. We teach on this one deliberately. We keep quiet on that other area because, uh, you know, if I read that, it will affect me because I borrowed money from that person I've not paid and I'm saying the wicked borroweth and payeth not. And then I read the verses before. I skip that one because if I read that one, that one will strike me. And then I read the other one. What games are we playing? Is this politics? Is this theater art? Are we deceiving ourselves? Are we deceiving the people of God? I will not deceive anybody. Somebody there, I will not deceive anybody. Read the word of God. Read the word of God. Read everything to them. Even if it affects you, read it. You're not going to tell church, when I'm reading this, I'm feeling guilty. When, after you are preached, it, it affects you. You go on your knees and pray. And then the people go on, your, on their knees and pray. And God will hear your prayer. Because God knows you are sincere. God knows you don't want to hide anything from anybody. You don't want to say, because I am going to hell, everybody must go to hell. Because I don't accept the truth, everybody must not know the truth. You are going to read everything. You are going to say, God help me. I need help in this area. I need help in this area. But I'm I'm going to preach it anyhow so that I will get to heaven and my people will get to heaven. We shall get to heaven together. And so that's how there is a contamination, contagious contamination of previously uh, pre faithful leadership. L, tell me. Lethargic leadership. L, tell me. E, tell me. Entangled leadership. A, tell me. Absconding leadership. D, tell me. Deceptive leadership, E, tell me. Evasive leadership, R, tell me. Ruinous leadership, and then S, tell me. Speechless leadership, H, tell me. Hypocritical leadership, I, tell me. Ignorant leadership, and P, tell me. Partial leader, I pray that God will kill us from this kind of leadership in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number three, the consistent concentration of positively fruitful leadership the consistent concentration you concentrate on this and you are consistent you are consistent you are consistent uh, the consistent concentration of positively fruitful leadership we're looking at daniel chapter 12 daniel chapter 12 and I'm reading from verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 3. In verse 3, And they that the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Somebody said, Amen. Amen. Are there wise people here tonight? You are wise. God will make you wiser. And then, as you are wise, you will shine as the brightness of famine forever in Jesus' name. And in our wisdom, you will turn. You will turn. Make a covenant with God. I will turn many to righteousness. I'll turn sinners away from their sins. Say it aloud. I'll turn sinners away from their sins. I will turn sinners away from Egypt. I will preach and Egypt will come out of them. My life will turn many people to righteousness. God confirm it. This ministry will prosper in your hand. And the Lord will use you mightily in Jesus' name. A positively fruitful leadership will bring, number one, souls out of Egypt. Will bring souls out of Egypt. Number two, will purge Egypt out of their souls. Will purge Egypt out of their souls. That's a positively fruitful ministry. Number three, will turn many to righteousness wholeheartedly, fully, completely. Will turn them away from sin, away from darkness, away from unrighteousness, and turn many to righteousness. Look at your congregation. Look at the people that see you. Look at the people that uh, interact with you. 
your local church, your district church, your group church, your region, your state, your country, and say, all those people, when you meet somebody, the first thought in your heart, I'm going to turn him to righteousness. He will believe righteousness. He will be made righteous. And the grace of God will be abundant in his life, on her life. If uh, somebody meets you and he wants to talk a business, wants to talk this and wants to talk that, your own conviction is whether business is there or not, this person I will turn him toward the righteousness. Number four, you make believers understand. You make them experience. You make them love. You make them prefer holiness above everything else. You make people love holiness. Make people prefer holiness. Make people experience holiness above every other thing. Number five, a truly positively fruitful leadership will train believers for soul winning. You want them to be fruitful. You don't want anybody under your care to be barren. Number six, you will influence them and you will establish godly families. Godly families. That the husband will understand I must be godly. While my wife is there, while my wife is not there, the wife will understand I must be godly. I have a covenant with God and with my husband. And the children, the families will understand we have to be godly. You're influencing the families and you're establishing the families to be godly. Number seven, promote Bible reading and personal, lively, devotional lives. You make people to love to read the Bible by themselves. They just know the word of God is for me. And you're influencing them that way. You promote Bible reading and personal, lively, devotional lives. And then number eight, should develop the faith of the members. The faith of the members should develop their faith. They know that God is on the throne. He will remove my mountain. No matter what it is, you're not uh, making them to look up to you as if you are the one to remove their mountain. It's their faith that will remove their mountain. And you're developing developing their faith. Number nine, you create thirst and desire for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. And then number ten, you are raising the level of faithfulness in all things. You are raising the level of faithfulness in the members. They want to be faithful. They desire to be faithful. They want to be faithful. And they have the experience Experience of the Lord in their hearts to be faithful. And you make faithfulness their watchword. And they just know that there's no other way to it. I must be faithful. Number 11, you embolden everyone for, with confidence and courage. Embolden everyone. You teach the people so that they, are fear, they only fear God. They don't fear man. And they have courage. They have confidence in God. And they know that whatever God has called me to do, that I must do. And I fear no man to the point I cannot obey. Be God because they have confidence and they have courage. Number 12, you enlist the whole church, enlist the whole congregation to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You make them to understand that we're a body together, we're united together, and this is the family of conscientious saints that will defend the faith and contend for that faith once delivered unto the saints. Fruitful you are going to be fruitful. Powerful, you are going to be powerful. You will not be barren. I said you will not be barren. Look at uh, Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 8. Second Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone here tonight, everyone who has said the word of God tonight, the Lord will raise you up. The Lord will lift you up. The fire of the Holy Ghost will come in every life in Jesus' name. Your leadership will be fruitful will be positive, will be practical, and will turn many unto righteousness in Jesus' name. Tonight, you will pray like you never prayed.
you will talk to God like you never talk to God. And you will say, Lord, today, let that fire start burning in my heart here tonight and turn me around to be another man. Make me a champion, make me a conqueror, and make me a person that is a soldier for Christ. And I will not back out anymore. All these deficiencies and things in my life tonight, they're going to be purged and cleansed away from my life in Jesus' name. Anybody there that is going to pray, you tell the Lord now, oh Lord, here I am. Do something tonight. Do something tonight. Do something tonight and change my personality and change my perspectives and change the direction of my life and change my, my, my leadership. And Lord, I want this to be done. I want this to be done. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord, I want this to be done. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, and the Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. The Lord will help you.